Okay, so I normally have a stand at NEC uh, in uh, Birmingham, but uh, this year I don't have a stand, so I'm just going to have a wander around and see what bikes uh, catch, well, take my fancy, catch my eye. I've already seen one, actually. Let me flip the camera around. Can't do that. Okay, so here we've got the, it's a CCM Spitfire, done up as a Dakar, long travel suspension, uh, Mazaki forks, a 21 inch front wheel, uh, I think it's a dummy tank. Uh, can we ask the gentleman in question? Good gentleman morning. of CC, CCM. John, tell us about this uh, bike, if you would. What have we got here? Well, this is sort of one of uh, a number of custom specials. And they're here really to, to gauge the appetite of uh, the, the sort of the next stage of the, uh, the Spitfire legacy. So um, it's hard to sort of imagine that with the exception of this classic 1970s Scrambler, the original sort of Clues Scrambler motorcycle, that everything else, they're all Spitfires. Yeah. So using that same 600cc single, the same frame, and then, you know, they've got just got different clothing on. Yeah, so different forks, longer travel suspension. Yeah. Chances of it making production? Well, already, um, social media starting to go crazy with people saying, build it, build it. So, um, the beauty of, of what um, what CCM created with the, the Spitfire was that it's just a perfect template to, yeah. to be whatever our customers want it to be. So I guess, um, you know, for a, a slight premium, not a huge amount of money, we can take the standard chassis and turn it into, a, a, you know, a beautiful Americana classic flat tracker, a Dakar replica, you name it. So what's the price on a Spitfire? Um, Typical price of a, a on the road Spitfire at the moment is is just under ten grand. Okay, so something like this, we could we could probably hand that over to a customer around about the fifteen grand mark. Okay, so that'd be a bespoke, almost bespoke. per bike. Yeah, we could do that with uh, you know the customer's own, own choice of paint colours, seat style, all for around about fifteen grand mark. Cool, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, second bike of interest I've found is this uh, Himalayan, uh, done up by Cooper Motorcycles, which is where I get my, well, it's got me a first Himalayan from. It's done quite a bit to it. Uh, sorry. Stock hangars, stock sump guard, but what they've done, I think we've got longer travel suspension, so we've got a, a spacer in the front suspension to give a bit, uh, I think it's a, a two inch or an inch and a half height increase at the front. And I think it's got a new shock on the rear. An adjustable rear shock. I'm not sure who makes that. I can't quite see. Uh, and then we've got tubeless uh, rims, front and rear. And I think the rear is running a little bit fatter. 130 on the rear. Uh, I've got a custom seat. <clears throat> uh, some chintzy foot pegs. And so it's on a Givy stand, so it's got the Givy Trekker luggage on it. And top box. I think it's got a Lexitech exhaust as well. Wait a second. I don't know if these are extremely polished headers. I don't know if they're a new header. It's a straight, looks like a straight through. And a Lexitech can on it. Yeah, nice that. I'm not sure what price it'll be for everything, but. Definitely a catalogue of parts that you could pick and choose your bits that you fancy. Okay, third bike to take my interest, Vstrom 1050 XT. It's interesting that actually, this it says now that we're on a Vstrom 1050 up from the thousand of last year, but actually the, the cylinder capacity is the same at 1037. That's what it always was and that's what it is still. They've just rebadged it as a 1050. I think it's got different throttle bodies and a few other bits to make it, I think another seven horsepower. From what I gather, and it's a slight disappointment, it's not a full redesign, it's just uh, largely cosmetic and electronic package change, and obviously that increase in power probably mated to the Euro 5 changes. Um, I really always like the V-Strom, I always think it's a been a really good underrated bike. Um, tubeless rims, which is good to see. Looks like we've got a different top yoke and risers on that, which will be better. It never really was very well set up for, for stood up riding. Also nice to see, we've got um, removable inserts in the foot pegs which is first for this year 
I really I quite like the graphics. I, really, I quite like the bike actually. Really like the the fairing design and the colour schemes. It works well. I also I just noticed. I think there's been a redesign on the header as well. I think so. I'm not entirely sure, but I think so. Just to bring it back in a bit, it used to flare out more than it does on there, uh, which just has enabled them to get this what looks to be a much better sump guard. And uh, I mean, that look at that there. That still protrudes quite a bit, which is a bit of a shame. But you know, I, I don't think Suzuki are ever going to be marketing this one as an off-road bike. Although on their uh, website they've got a news release on the Hesler uh, off-road kit that they, that Hesler, a German tuner, sells for it. Uh, which gives it longer travel suspension and a few other bits. Um, I think the biggest thing, price. What's that? 11299, uh, which is, you know, a great value bike uh, compared to Versus Thousands, which have gone up to sort of 14,000 or what, Tiger 800s, which are up for 12 and a half or so. So I think price-wise it's really competitive and I think visually quite striking. Not the DR Big that we uh, probably were hoping for, but that was probably a little bit too much of a stretch to expect. So New headlight, looks good. New height adjustable screen. Odd that they've got the adjuster on the, on the front, hardly conducive to changing it as you ride but one of those things yeah I quite like that quite like that this is quite an interesting observation the Benelli uh, TRK 502X is actually getting a lot of interest parallel twin CB500X rival <clears throat> 47 brake horsepower spoke rims which is what everyone's crying out for you know it's a big bike with a medium sized engine uh, I've ridden the standard TRK 502 and the X I really like it actually I think they're really good bikes well equipped you know 12 volt charger on it uh, good crash bars centre stand as standard you know you've got a good rack on the rear Givy tracker uh, cases and optional extras uh, handsome bike I mean look at the price I think the difficulty Benelli has got is getting the bike out there. You know, it's getting a lot of interest on this stand, but it needs it needs something for people to walk into a dealer and buy a five and a half grand bike that's, <clears throat> that's got no sort of credibility, I guess. And I think that's probably where it's struggling. It struggles for a bit of credibility. I think what doesn't help Benelli is that they sell through backstreet dealers or multi-franchise dealers. And I think it's just stopping the brand getting established in its own right. But you know, that's a really good bike for not a lot of money. Uh, new CB500X for 2019, I think six grand. So it's 500 less, better equipped. And it's got a bigger bike feel than the 500X. Tough one. Would I buy one with my own money? I think that's always the hardest uh, thing. Or would you walk straight past it and buy a 500X even if potentially it's not a, as good a bike? Hmm. Interesting. Just been talking to a guy here who does this artwork. Look at the look at the equipment he uses to create it. And how good it is. Look at that. Amazing. Does commissions or he's got prints um warehouses? Thought about it. Amazing stuff. Amazing. It does them in like a day or two. He's got a stand here at the show and he'll do a print in, I think, you know, do six, six or seven prints, new prints over the course of the week. If anybody needs his details, it's Ian Cook, Paint with Cars. www.popbangcolor.com. Yeah, cool.
Okay, I guess the big one for this show, uh, 390 Adventure KTM. Um, five and a half grand UK price confirmation. I can't say it's initially overly impressive. It kind of grabs you in the same way that a 310 GS grabs you. It's quite small, it's quite low uh, ground clearance, cat's wheels, a lot of plastic on it. LED lights which are going to be uh, expensive to replace if damaged. Nice seat on it and a nice cockpit area, nice screen. You know, it's got the initial attention grabbing details such as the screen and the uh, and the plastics and the colours which is, I guess are going to get the flashy crowd, the people who just want something that looks good, that looks flashy. I can't say as it would trouble me to swap the Himalayan for one. I know it's got more power, probably, what is it, 39 horsepower versus 25 horsepower. But I don't think as a travel bike it would match the Himalayan. As a street bike with a bit of dirt ability, then yeah, you know, possibly would. Is that Tom Brain? <laughs> How are you, mate? Tell us what you think about this, Tom. I'm, I'm just giving my thoughts on it. Tom is a veteran garbage runner. Tom, what do you, what do you think? First impressions? Uh, I've got a little bit of a look online and it yeah. looks the right size, you know, bit of off road in. Yeah, yeah. What do you currently ride? Sorry, what uh, do you currently BMW ride? BMW 1200 GS. And you'd swap a 1200 for this or have it as a. As, you'd have both. Yeah. Let's have a look. Don't, don't tell my wife. <laughs> don't tell his wife, he said. Do you like the look of it? Yeah. Uh, looks looks alright. Do you see it more as a road bike or a dirt bike? For me, well, I mean, I, I get abroad quite a lot, so I'd probably use it in Spain, given the chance, a bit of off-road, yeah, yeah. light off -road. Like gravel trails and stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah. you take one of these down to Spain on the road, on yeah, the tarmac, yeah, yeah? I think so, yeah. OK. Yeah. The right, uh, that's a little bit higher. <laughs> a bit more of a screen. Yeah, yeah. Night, do you like the clocks? Yeah, I mean, you're never quite sure in bright sunlight, but... Uh, do you want me to tell you if it suits you? I think you'd have to change your, your trainers. <laughs> right size for you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what a lot of people are going to say, isn't it? Right size. I mean, I was just thinking, you know, it's not for me in the sense that I wouldn't replace my Himalayan for one because I don't think it's as simple, robust, droppable, crashable. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, it's not got that usability that I like in the Himalayan. If you're in the back of beyond. If they're in the back of beyond, I think I'd probably take the Himalayan. But as a street bike, like you say, if we're going out to Spain, I think with 39 horsepower, it's going to be a lot nicer to go down there than a 25 horsepower thumper. All right, thank you. Five and a half grand. So about the same price as a 310 GS. And I think it's got the legs over that, certainly in the power of the look stake and the equipment stake. It's got a lot of electronics on it, ABS traction control. Yeah, you know, it's just, a, I think it's a better package than the BM. It really shows the BM up as being a bit of a lazy effort from, from them. Uh, some are gonna poo poo the idea of the cast wheels. They're gonna want spokes and I believe they're in the Power Sport accessory catalog, you know. But ultimately, KTM could never, or anybody could never bring in the trail bike focus type of bike that we want for the type of money we're going to pay. This is a bike built for the world market, mainly South America, Central America and Asia. And it's got to appeal to that market. We're going for a ride, Tom. <laughs> okay, so just on the Royal Enfield stand, uh, not many changes for the Himalayan, just a new paint schemes, which quite like this grey one, uh, the blue and white one there. Actually, it looks quite nice, that blue and white one. A little bit more chintzy than the standard colours. And then we've got a red. And then the red and black, which I don't I don't quite see what they were trying to do with that. Well, I think the main thing is there's no, been no price increase for 2020. Still 4199 on the road. Uh, some of you all know I'm, I'm on the uh, second one now. Um, really like the bikes. Just been looking at the KTM 390 Adventure. Would I swap that for a Himalayan or would I swap my Himalayan for a 390 Adventure? No, uh, just because I like the durability of the Himalayan. There's nothing to break on it. Very simple technology. No LED headlights, no LED clocks, uh, no, no traction control or more complex electronics to fail at points along the way. So, yeah, you know, 
no big engineering changes for 2020 certainly no 650 version which people keep speculating about which I still don't believe is ever going to happen uh, but the main thing is that we've got no price rise you know and I think that's more important than anything so yep here we are in the presence of the one and only Austin Vince here he is <laughs> Stalking with his brand new CRF with his custom Honda Fit factory panniers. I don't think this is standard issue rackage. Maybe a tour tech. Okay, so we're on the Yamaha stage oh, with okay. the uh, world famous uh, Graham Hoskin, star of Adventure Bike TV. Graham, tell us about your new uh, Amazon project. So, uh, Adventure Bike TV has been running for uh, almost, we're now sixth year now, and it's always been on YouTube. And our challenge on YouTube is people tend to go to YouTube for two or three minute clips and not to watch a whole TV show. So that's the reason why we're switching now to Amazon Prime. So there's going to be six parts coming out, one per week. Uh, still the same kind of stuff, bike reviews, trips, hints and tips, but on Amazon Prime and that will be six parts from the middle of December. But all the other stuff, there'll still be loads of clips and things on YouTube and on the Adventure Bike TV website. And what's the most exciting thing you've done so far for the series? Ooh, um, proving what a great adventure you can have on 125s in your own country. Nice. So Amazon, mid-December? Mid mid-December, yeah, cool. Amazon Prime. Um, and if you don't have Amazon Prime, you can watch it on Patreon for a pound a month. And uh, your favourite bike of the show so far? Yeah. That's you Sim. Have to, you have to watch it to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Lame. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Okay, so we're just on the Yamaha stand, just looking at the uh, T7. It's a bike I've not ridden yet, but keen to. This is a bike that Nick Sanders rode, for, rode from uh, Paris to Dakar. Um, I think what, what I found quite quite interesting about T7 is this time last year when they showed the exact same production bike, there were a lot of people on the forums on the blog saying, uh, you know, it looked pre-production, it didn't look good enough quality, there were cheap plastics on it, and all the rest. Uh, then they announced the price of it, 884 eight, on a pre-order, and then it sold like hotcakes. I think simply because it, it shows that you get the price right on it, um, a bike will sell. You know, you can forgive it, a bike a few sins if it's priced, a, 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 you know, a good price, and I think 85 for that bike, especially with a man there from KTM, you know, 12 grand for the uh, 790 Adventure R really left a lot of ground for Yamaha to steal beneath that. Uh, and I think if the Yamaha had come in at 10 grand, they would have struggled, but at eight and a half, it almost becomes a no-brainer, you know, to saving almost four grand on a KTM. And for all intents and purposes, it'll do pretty much the same job. I've ridden a 790 Adventure R, and it's a, you know, it's a phenomenal piece of technology. Would it be a bike I'd try, sorry, would it be a, would it be a bike I'd buy to travel around the world on? No, probably not, because it's got too many sensors and electronics, and it's a little bit highly strung for me. But that T7, save myself four grand, get a bike that's just as capable, you know, about the same weight, 195 kilos. I think it looks as good as a KTM. It's going to ride almost as good. It's not quite got the same adjustments and the suspension, but um, I think arguably it's a more sturdy machine. I, I kind of think of it similar to a Himalayan in a way. It's a very functional, basic machine that just does the job and they've priced it right. I think it's a bit of a lesson to the other manufacturers, you know. Something like a GS1200 or 1250 can get away at, with charging a premium. I don't think that bike is very price sensitive. People will pay whatever BMW you want to charge for a 1250. Now upwards of 20 grand for a well-spec 1250. But every other bike, I think they've got to compete on price. And a lot of, a lot of manufacturers seem to forget that and think that because somebody will pay 16 grand for a GS, they'll pay it for a Triumph or a Ducati Multistrada. And I don't think that's the case. So I think for Yamaha to realise, you know, bring it in a, a good price and I think it's paid dividends in the sales so keen to get a go on one I can't say as I'm overly appealed overly attracted to its to its design or its image but I think it's going to be a capable bike 
and a good choice for the America trip next year. Or one of those instead. Well, as look what we found at the back of the, uh, well, I should say, so there's the main stand with all the new bikes. And slightly uh, tucked away, all the old Dakar bikes. XT550. Nice Super Tenno at the back, 750. I wonder if that's Woodcutter's bike, I'm not sure. So, I, know, I mean, to be honest, I don't know my models that well. An FZT 900. Looks like another one. It looks like a TTR 600, is that? Yeah, TTR 600. WR 450. Yeah, it just kind of shows a good pedigree that Yamaha have got. And that T7, I think that's a good move for them. It, you know, there was a danger it was going to be so heavily diluted, but it looks like they've come good with that T7. Good price, good basic mechanicals. Uh, I've not ridden one, but apparently they're good to ride. So, yeah, I think it's a good move from Yamaha. Really good. Be interesting to see if uh, Ondo or anybody else sort of answers them with another, come, you know, comes back with a mid-sized bike of their own, and, 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 you know, an 800cc Africa Twin would be ideal. So we're just on Harley Davidson stand, uh, looking at the Pan America from the front first, probably its ugliest angle. But I think from the side, it actually looks pretty good. I don't know much about it. 145 horsepower. Is about all I know. We don't know weight. It's expected to be at least 280, I would suspect. But it, I mean, they fitted it with Anarchy Wild tyres, uh, tubeless rims by the looks of it. You know, sturdy aluminium boxes. I mean, where, where'd, you, where'd, you, where'd you price that? You know, if that comes in at 15 grand, that's going to get a lot of people in. If they price it at 20, 22, you know, that it's not going to get anyone in. But a sensible price. I quite like it. Look at that front end though. It's just it's just bonkers. I just like it because it, it's different. I think it's, it's going to be an effective long distance tour, I think, looking at that screen. And I don't know, it's not a GS or a KTM or a Honda. Just stopped to have a quick look at this TZR 250 blast from the past. I had a TZR 125R which was identical in look to this, but obviously just a 125 engine but same fairing, cockpit, tank, seat cowl. I had one that I wrote off when I was 17 and I bought a second one, Vance and Irons colours. Love that bike, 28 brake horsepower, obviously a two stroke. Yeah, they were the days. They were the days. Same instruments. Oh, fond memories of that bike. There's a KR1S over there as well. It could be just be me but I think Honda have jumped the shark a bit with the prices on this new Africa Twin. I get that it's increased engine displacement, TFT screen and a few other bits. I'll gather they're tubeless. Are they tubeless rims? No, they are on the uh, Adventure Sport. Tubeless on the Adventure Sport but non-tubeless on the Rant standard one. I believe it's got cruise control as well. Sorry mate, no I'm just filming probably the most complicated uh, switch gear ever. Thanks mate, cheers. Um, but a starting price of 13 grand for an Africa Twin? I would say too much, especially when the V-Strom 1000 or the V-Strom 1050 is now 11. You know, I, don't, I just think Honda have over-egged their pricing a little bit with that, especially as really the, the popularity of the Africa Twin, as good a bike as it is, really only took off once the discount to the arse out of them. And you could get a PCP deal for 79 a month or you could buy them brand new for cash for 9 grand. You know, I think 
and that's that's when a bike finds its true value pretty much like the KTM's the 1290's and the 1090's which they also discounted the arse out of to get bikes out of showrooms I think they've I think 13 and 18 grand for an Africa twin is just a little bit too much a little bit too much nice bike but not an 18 grand bike I mean cornering LEDs really cornering LEDs I just don't see it I don't see it I think manufacturers have gone mad with the pricing absolutely mental it's just it's just too strong money for for that bike just on the AJP stand uh, looking at the PR7 I really really like that um, money no object I think that's one of the bikes I'd be buying I just really like it it's focused there's not a lot to it it's a very simple design but it looks a very functional and uh, just functional and focused bike Looks like a decent seat, I like the tablet in the uh, cockpit for navigation. Uh, Portuguese designed, own, same engine as the SWM uh, Super Jewel, same engine as in the CCDM, CCM Spitfire as well. So it's uh, the old Husky uh, T630 engine, I believe. Uh, yeah. Norton Atlas and Ranger or Nortus Atlas Ranger interesting it's an interesting thing this I, I gather the, it's a, a Chinese production could be wrong on that but the £10,000 price tag suggests that it is and from what I read that's what's, what it is um, kind of a messy a bit of a messy style lots of pipes cables uh, engine guards um, hmm it doesn't it looks a bit yeah messy cluttered I would say but if it rides well ten thousand pounds it's a lot of bike for the money a lot of brand for the money a lot of kudos for the money uh, and it really sort of times nicely with the the retro scrambler theme looks like Royal Enfield or the same supplier as the Royal Enfield panniers for it um, yeah not setting me pulse of racing and to be honest there's not anybody looking around it either here i think it's a bit of a mistake not to let people get a bit closer to it i'm not sure what that indicates whether that indicates good or bad things the fact that you can't get arm's length to it hmm we'll see could be great could be crap i'm just watching these yams go around this off-road course and obviously it's not overly indicative of how good they are in the real world but they do look very agile they look the right size, they look the right riding position, good slimness, they look a dainty bike compared to is it that 700 there, and then you've got the Tiger. The Tiger's quite bulbous, a lot of plastic, a lot of tank, a lot of bars and, and, and stuff going on. It looks heavy, it looks weighty. That Yam looks really, looks really good. It carries itself well. So that was it, uh, my day out at NEC, I forgot to do a closing video, so just doing what next day, but, uh, so, sorry, that's washing, mach washing machines going, um, some good bikes there, you know, some, some interesting adventure stuff, there's a lot of choice out there, I think it seems like watching that video back for myself, price is, is such a, a determining factor to me of a bike success, you know, uh, like it or not, the Himalayan's been a good success, and it's good price, four grand, you know, people have just bought them because you know what can you lose at four grand t7 people are buying that can't get enough of them can't make enough of them eight and a half grand kind of suggests that get a bike's price right and it will sell you've got to make a really amazing product for it to be uh not sensitive to price uh pricing levels and i, I think you know i think suzuki have done it right with the v-strom 1050 11 grand which will probably soon be discounted to 10 and a half by the time they eat the dealers but i think honda you know at 13 grand and 
what's some of the other stuff. I think the 390 Adventure KTM is not bad at five and a half, but again, you know, five and a half grand for an entry level adventure bike, oh, it's a bit of a stretch still. So we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, this coming year. Uh, three bikes for me, AJP PR7 stood out. I just think it's, fo I like its focus. And, and again, nine grand for that bike, doesn't seem bad value for a nice bespoke uh, European made bike. Uh, the uh, Tenere 700, I, I just like, I, I like the functionality of it. I can't say as I love the styling, but the functionality I really like. And again, the price tag. And I, and I was also, the V-Strom 1050, I guess, gets my attention. I just like the yellow graphics. Lastly, the Motor Guzzi uh, V8 5TT, which I, I didn't get a film of. But uh, that's always appealed to me. But I don't know, seeing it again in the flesh, I just, I like its uh, tubeless rim. I think, no, it's not got tubeless rims, but it's got a shaft drive. And I kind of like the practicality of it, but visually it just, I just, I just couldn't get, couldn't get the grips with it. So I said, I definitely recommend a day out at the NEC, some good bikes and, uh, you know, I, I could do two days there quite easily. So yeah, I'm quite impressed to see it as a, as a punter. I've always sort of thought it was a bit of a crap show, but, uh, it's easy to think like that when you stood nine days on an exhibition stand, but walking around as a punter, quite enjoyed it. See you there next year.